Well, let me start with this. This is the uh, uh, protocol for how we do grindstone evoke potential. Um, uh, the, uh, we use, typically use ear inserts for the stimulus. And uh, there's two ideas. One is condensation produces a pressure into the ear, and rarefaction produces a pressure away from the ear. Um, and uh, we like to use alternating patterns. So I don't know if, if the system you have can do that or not. But so you do one rarefaction, one condensation, one rarefaction, one condensation. So that helps get rid of the uh, microphonic artifact at the beginning. So, um, the stimulus rates that we use Stimulus rates are <coughs> between 8 and 30 hertz, and we typically use either 9.27 or 17.5. If the, if the patient has good hearing, we'll use the higher stimulus rate. Um, so we'll stimulate at 17 hertz, 17 times per second. Um, the, uh, if they have poor hearing, we'll use the low stimulus rate because it gives more time for uh, the, the stimulant to be conducted efferently. Uh, the stimulus is applied non-orally, so to the side you're operating on. And the stimulus intensity is below 110 dB. Uh, typically, it's 90 dB, 95 dB. Sometimes it's 85 dB. Um, the, ref the reference is sound pressure level, so 0 0.0004 dimes per centimeter squared. And then we'll use white noise on the contralateral side, on the non-operative side, to mask uh, the, sti the stimulus so you don't get a a uh, crossover response. I presume you do pretty much the same uh, same thing. Um, for recording, we like to use three three montages, three electrode configurations. So vertex to uh, the left ear, vertex to the right ear, and vertex to the cervical spine level two, so somewhere below the occipital. Um, the brainstem potential waves are considerably smaller than the cortical waves, so they're on the are there, they have a magnitude on the order of uh, 0.1 to 0.5 microvolts, so half a microvolt amplitude. Um, we use a high pass filter at 30 hertz, 30 hertz and a low pass filter at a thousand hertz. Some people uh, <coughs> put their high pass filter at 100 hertz. Some people put their low <coughs> pass filter at 3000 hertz. We found that this worked really well and it pretty much settled on that. Observation window will use between 10 to 20 milliseconds. I tend to favor 10 milliseconds. My partner likes 20 milliseconds. Uh, doesn't make any difference. That's just how big the window of data is you're looking at. And the number of stimuli that will average is, uh, typically we'll try to do it with 512. Um, very, very seldom do we have to go more than a thousand and four. Many <coughs> times we can get responses with 256 stimuli. So again, trying to, you know, if you're doing 
if you can get it with 256 stimuli and you're stimulating it, you know, 17 hertz, it's only uh, 15 seconds to get a response. To, so it's, it's very close to, to real time. Um, so this is what the data looks like. Uh, this is uh, data from one case. Um, the data starts at the top of the waterfall. We call these displays waterfall displays. I do something similar to display your data. Wave 5 is marked. And you can see the door is open, and wave 5 is pretty much where it was at the beginning of the case. And as the retractor is placed, wave 5 starts to move out. Uh, microvascular decompression was completed here, and there had been really no remarkable change in the amplitude of this large wave. You can see it. But it had moved out about a millisecond uh, from the baseline. After they closed the dura, and it went away. So, uh, you know, the question, of course, is uh, why did it go away? Uh, so they reopened the dura and they re-explored the posterior fossa. And, and they found that, in fact, they hadn't really decompressed the nerve when they thought they had decompressed it. Um, and somehow the artery had shifted and, and uh, really uh, taken the response out entirely. So they completed the decompression and then reclosed the door. And you can see at the end of the case, it was back to uh, pretty much back to baseline. Uh, the uh, uh, such an unexpected way that the monitoring could help. You know, you, you, uh, something happens after you think you've done the operation, and, and it turns out to have a real significance. Uh, you don't know that unless you, you know, you would never know unless you were willing to go back and reopen the door and, and look. So uh, that was a, a trigeminal case that we did. This is just an example of three sets of data uh, using the 20 millisecond window. And you can see this is wave five here, wave five, wave five in the three uh, electrodes that I mentioned that would be our standard configuration. Uh, in this case, we were also monitoring uh, cranial nerve temp. Um, there was no, really no changes in brainstem potentials. There was irritation of cranial nerve temp. Um, so that, that's kind of the idea behind the trigeminal neurology case. Um, I want to skip ahead from here. Um, Actually, let me do a little bit of this. So, the, uh, I'm going to kind of jump into the middle of the of the cranial nerve EMG story. Uh, so, uh, muscle discharges are generated when uh, several things can happen to cause it. One is the the axon membrane is depolarized. It can be mechanically irritated or stimulated. <coughs> It can be metabolically stimulated, thermally, can be ischemic or traumatic. And when these happen, you get neurotonic discharges. We call them neurotonic discharges, in either very brief firing patterns. Um, and they're, they're brief firing patterns of motor unit potential. So this is what the neurotonic discharges are going to look like. Uh, I forget what human wire to do. I think that's this is Mattel's. Um, we were monitoring a number of cranial nerves in that case, and we got these very, you know, precise bursts of patterns. So, uh, they're they're indicative of irritation. Uh, they're not necessarily indicative of injury, but if you see activity like that on an EMG uh, channel, it's 
uh, a warning that you could be getting close to injuring the cranial nerve that you're working on. So you need to, need to be aware of that. Um, we, we use the terminology uh, uh, for the evoked motor potentials from either cranial nerves or spinal nerves, um, it doesn't matter. We call them um, compound muscle potentials. I think people use that's, I think that's a terminology a lot of people use. Um, and they're, in, they're a monitor of the integrity of a nerve segment from the point where you stimulate it. So you get the compound motor potential by stimulating the nerve. And what it's telling you is from the point you stimulate distally, the nerve is intact. So that's an important thing to keep in mind because if you have injured the nerve more proximally and you stimulate distally, you're still going to get this evoked EMG, compound motor potential. So it won't tell you anything about whether or not you injured the nerve. So you've got to always stimulate, you know, uh, proximal with respect to where you think the injury is. Um, it, t it gives you a certain amount of information. Uh, the onset latency tells you something about the conduction of the nerve that you're stimulating. Uh, and so you can use that to differentiate between, uh, for example, trigeminal and facial nerves when you think you're stimulating the one or the other. The trigeminal nerve will fire sooner than the facial nerve. And so that conduction time can be helpful when you're trying to sort uh, things out. The, the amplitude is proportional to the number of functional axons. Now, um, there's no absolute measure of that. Uh, uh, it's, it's within the patient, so the patient's reference is himself. So if you start out and you have a, a certain amplitude uh, compound muscle potential that you're getting, and you start to lose that amplitude, and you can't infer the loss as due to anything else to your subject as anesthesia. But you know, you can't infer the, the losses due to anything else or cooling or something. Then it probably means that you're uh, injuring part of the nerve. So you've got to kind of, kind of pay attention to that amplitude and try to understand, uh, you know, as the surgeon stimulating, if the amplitude is falling, try to understand what the mechanisms are that are causing that. Um, so it's, it's, it's proportional, but it's not, you know, it's not, an, none of this stuff is absolute. It's not like you can say, bang, this is it, this is the number. It doesn't quite work that way. Uh, stimulation, you can use constant current, constant voltage. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we've used both. Uh, they've worked equally well. Um, anesthesia, again, uh, uh, cranial nerves tend to be less affected uh, by, muscu by uh, neuromuscular blocking agents than do limb muscles. So if you're, if you're doing a patient and you want to check if they've got four twitches back, they're, they're the number of twi t uh, twitches are going to be different in the limbs than they are in the facial area. So you got to kind of be aware of that. Uh, I really like patients to be totally off of the neuromuscular agents at the time that uh, we're trying to use the monitoring as a tool because uh, sometimes the changes are so subtle that if you, if you have the patient on any muscle relaxant at all, it may affect it. Now, a lot of people argue that. I say, well, you can have them with two twitches and everything works fine. Uh, I'm a little bit more conservative. Um, and, and I made the point that can be monitored in the presence. If they're kept low enough, I, I prefer none, but I think you know, people make an argument and, and certainly they're happy with their results, so uh, I think you, you've got to figure out what's best for your practice.
So uh, we're going to skip this for the time being. Well, I'm going to go back to this for a second. Uh, we do do a lot of uh, water tires and we'll do uh, um, heavy facial spasm. We'll, we'll record uh, cranial nerve 7, but we'll, we'll also record from cranial nerve 5 just to um, help get the topology of how the cranial nerves are, are laying uh, laid out for people. And so this is a little bit of how we do that. Um, uh, cranial nerve 5 is the facial, mostly facial sensation, but it's the largest, largest muscle of mastication, so it's easy to record from and to get a good EMG from it. Um, and like I said, we use it to distinguish between the trigeminal and the facial nerve. A lot of the surgeons really like that. They'll stimulate them uh, both intracranial to, to uh, attempt to differentiate them. Um, this is the point I was making earlier, and this is some helpful and is actually helpful in a lot of skull based cases too. The, tri the trigeminal nerve will typically have the beginning of the compound muscle potential occurring at around four to five milliseconds, and the facial nerve will typically be a little bit later. I put six to eight milliseconds there. Uh, you know, it's in that it's in that range of difference. It's about a two millisecond difference between the two. Uh, between the muscles exciting the other two nerves. So that turns out to be extremely helpful to keep that in mind. Uh, uh, you know, because many times anatomically it's very hard to tell the difference. And you're stimulating, and you stimulate one nerve and it comes in, and you stimulate the next nerve and it comes in a little bit later, so you can deduce then which nerve is which. So I, th I think that's one of those things that's extremely helpful to people. So, so um, the uh, facial nerve monitor, which of course is the, is the key to the hemifacial spasm cases, um, we usually we usually report from three muscle groups. Some people record from four, and then we found three to be, to be really adequate. Uh, either again constant voltage or constant current, it really doesn't matter. Uh, we, like, we, pick, we have standardized on a pulse width of 200 microseconds, 0.2 milliseconds. And so we use that same pulse width for everything. Um, and, and we have found that it makes it easier to understand the data. Uh, we use standard use a stimulus rate of 5.1 hertz. So when we're, when we're doing hemifacial spasm, we're stimulating at 5.1 hertz. When we're stimulating a cranial nerve directly, we're stimulating at 5.1 hertz. So it, it gives us enough time between stimuli. Um, that's about 190 milliseconds between two stimulus pulses. You're recording data over 50 or 60 milliseconds. So it gives a, enough time for the nerve to recover. It's a low duty cycle. Uh, and the amplitude um, you know, the, of the stimulus is usually less than 20 millivolts or 20 milliamps. And again, they, they map pretty well in teaching. Um, this was a redo of a, of a uh, trigeminal neuralgia uh, where a bunch of things were done. Uh, we did brain stems, uh, cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, and 10 with EMGs and compound muscle potentials. So you can see this is what the compound muscle potentials look like. You can see how robust they are. Uh, this was irritation activity on the mentalis. Again, you can see quiet on the other two branches. That branch got uh, really exciting. And uh, you can see the brainstem potentials there. Uh, Bob, can you explain why, why would you monitor 9 and 10 for a trigemma? Do you need trigemma? Is it just for your information? Yeah, it was this, the, no, that was the, actually the surgeon specifically who requested that. He was concerned about distorted anatomy, and he was worried about 
having to go lower than he thought he would have to go. And so he requested that. Normally we wouldn't do that. That was just a, 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 a fluke of that operation. Did you do EMGs at Allegheny with your fifth third decompression? I just typically do BSCRs. Um, it depends on the surgeon. Some, a couple of the surgeons really want the EMGs. Um, it, it makes them more comfortable. And then we've had this discussion. Uh, and and I, I, I'm kind of, a, I kind of advocate doing as much as you have to do, but as little as you can, you know, so you're not overwhelmed because you can have a lot of data. But, you know, you know, if a surgeon, a particular surgeon would do that, with says, I really like it. In fact, we joke with him that he wants cranial nerves, one through everything. Do you find, I, I would, sorry to interject, I, I don't work at his center anymore. I, I would, in my hands, it would make me I feel for Jim around after watching Dr. Janetta do so many. Yeah. Uh, he was very aggressive on the nerve. Yeah. Very aggressive. And, and um, we didn't see a lot of deficits that turned yeah. down on the nerve. Yeah. Um, and I just, I hate to leave it partially treated because I'm seeing some yeah. muscle yeah. activity and yeah. it makes me nervous. But it's like, but I, yeah. I really don't like to monitor things. Well, that are going to interfere with my ability to finish yeah, out. And I, I personally agree with that. So let me give you a little more history of this surgeon. Because this mark, he has a higher failure rate. I'm um, just curious. He has a different philosophy. Okay. So he trained at Cincinnati University. That's John Tu. John Tu. And so I don't know if you're aware of the, of the discussion that went on between Professor Janetta and Professor Tu over a 20-year period of time, but it, it, they, they had di diametrically opposing viewpoints of the world when it came to microvascular decompression. So people that train with John Tunes will, if, if they just don't section the nerve, they will monitor an awful lot of stuff. There's this kind of thing that is a different viewpoint. And then the people that, that train with Peter Janetta will do great stem potentials for trigeminal neuralgia. And, and you, know, you, you try to have these discussions, and, and of course it's embedded in how people are trained and <coughs> how the thing may be. So, um, I know this, I am absolutely agree. It's sometimes it's absolutely different, different uh, surgical situation. For example, like this case, mm -hmm. this mega vessel. Yeah. And so, by this reason, we need to examine all these vessels. Yeah. Sometimes not so all the, the point of connection between five nerves yeah. and an artery. Yeah. And we need to examine <coughs> long distance. And sometimes, for all these vessels, we need to open our arachnoid close to low cranial nerve. Yeah. Yeah. And by this reason, in these cases, this type of monitoring is very yeah, but ninety percent of cases yeah. is very yeah. low. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. It's not yeah. so low. Like, yeah. uh, but it's uh, surgery. Yeah. It's yeah. So there are definitely a small set of, subset of cases in which the anatomy is, is distorted for whatever reason. You want to be prepared to go lower, lower than you normally think you might have to, just to explore. The great majority of cases. Uh, now, the, this fellow that I'm referring to, he does the fifth nerve trigeminal EMG on every trigeminal microvascular decompression because of the influence of John II on him, who, who uh, had a different perspective. And I, and I don't know if uh, Brett was in the program, Peter used to have uh, John II come up and spend a day with a visiting professor, and it was always a very good discussion for an hour or two, and, and they never resolved the issues between themselves. Uh, but, it, but it was it was interesting because you learned to, to think about the different perspectives, and there definitely are different perspectives. Uh, so this is. 
EMG activity, uh, irritation activity occurring on cranial or seven. Uh, again, it looks like irritation activity, once you've seen it, on a peripheral nerve or a cranial nerve, it looks the same. Um, this, this was close to becoming full-blown injury activity, but we consider this still to be, to be irritation. Uh, there should be no, any facial spasm case coming up. Um, so cases involving cranial nerve 7, of course, just the list in the CPA. Uh, CPA tumors, large CPA tumors. Any facial spasm you really want to get to. Uh, which is unilateral facial nerve hyperactivity. I mean, everybody has seen it, I'm sure. So, um, the, the typical spasm begins in the orbicularis oculi and spreads downward. A typical spasm begins lower and spreads up. Uh, and I would guess most cases are typical because that's why it's called typical. And I think the outcome. The outcomes of the surgery are far better with the typical cases. Uh, the, the numbers that I remember already made, made. I think like for the, the typical hemifacial spasm, uh, the, the, if the lateral spread went away with the decompression, there was like an 80 to 90 percent chance the patient was cured uh, with the atypical Lateral spread, and we'll show you what the lateral spread looks like, which is what you come uh, First of all, it was harder to get it to go away. Maybe only half the cases you could get it to go away, and then maybe only 50 or 60 percent of those patients would be cured. So the numbers were very different between the two. And so Peter was convinced they were very fundamentally different disease processes. Um, but I, I don't, I don't know that anybody's. Uh, I'm gonna maybe, maybe it will be very useful. Uh, yeah. Explain. Uh, Should I come up? Here we go. You all know what the lateral spread yeah. is. We wanted to ask you. We have an, we have an article here about it. Just okay. Okay. If you can tell us. He's gonna explain it. I'm gonna try to explain. It. It's very, <laughs> very helpful for this surgery. Very helpful. Yeah. So. Uh, so this is an example of, of lateral spread. And let's just talk about the example at first. So uh, this is directly stimulating the branch of the seventh nerve to the ubiquitin side. This is recording from the mentalis muscle, stimulating that same branch. If the patient has hemifacial spasm, what was found was that that branch going to the mentalis muscle was hyperexcitable, and that's called lateral spread. And we forced that to happen, uh, and I'll tell you how in a second. Now, you're going to say, well, why does that happen? And, and in fact, there are two competing theories that, as far as I know, have never to this day still been <coughs> resolved. One is that uh, the, the uh, haunting facial nucleus is, is hyper-excited for some reason. Okay, now the thing that's, that's uncomfortable about that theory is you say to yourself, why would doing something peripherally change the excitability of the haunting nucleus? Well, there's got to be, for that theory to work, there's got to be efferent flow back, or afferent flow back into the nucleus and going in the wrong direction. The, the competing theory is that there are effective transmissions set up between branches of the seventh nerve. Uh, and, and so those are the two theories. Uh, and I think they both are still, people will still argue over each. And it's almost a religion with people that do this, this operation how you pick between them. But the important part is that you get this phenomenon of this response being, being produced that you shouldn't produce. Now what we do is we stimulate at the zygomatic arch. And 
as I said, we recorded a direct response from the vicular esophagus in this thing we call lateral spread from the metallus. So it's a it's a it's an evoked EMG. We're stimulating at 5.1 Hz, like we always do. That occurs in the patients that have hemifacial spasm, and you can't evoke that. I've never seen it. We've tried, and we've worked with the people in the EMG lab also trying to do it. If a person doesn't have the phenomenon, the disease of hemifacial spasm, you cannot evoke that lateral spread, the thing we call lateral spread. So now the end point of the operation is to eliminate the lateral spread. So uh, the, the surgeon's looking at how the arteries are up against the nerve and they're typically at the root entry zone. And but it's very hard to see all the arteries compressing the nerve. Uh, you, you know, you've got a, if you think of looking through a microscope, you're looking at a planar view, a two-dimensional view onto a three-dimensional object. And the, even though the optics are great, you can't see everything. You've got to rotate the microscope to try to see behind, and it can get very complicated. So this is a good measure. When this thing goes away, if it's typical hemifacial spasm, namely it started in, in the upper regions of the face, you've got an 80% chance of having cured the patient. So um, that's what lateral spread is. It's this evoked EMG which is produced in, in a very abnormal way. So you stimulate one branch and it triggers the response in another branch, which is, shouldn't happen. Usually in our country, we use the term abnormal muscle response. Okay. Uh -huh. And so, if you term abnormal muscle response, everybody understands you. Uh -huh. If you tell lateral spread, it's nobody it's, understands. Nobody understands. <laughs> and so, it's very important that you explain. And we know this is a very useful option, but it's very important that we know all terms. Lateral yes. spread, abnormal muscle response. We, we had the uh, Adi Moller. Yeah. We had, what was his nationality? Swedish. So we had a Swedish guy that would help in the OR. He would get, he would literally be in the corner mm -hmm. and he would start telling Dr. Jim, he'd get so excited. Yeah. The lateral spread is gone. The lateral spread is gone. <laughs> lateral spread is gone. It was like, he just would get so excited. Yeah. By it. Yeah. I had a case, that's why I mentioned this case, it was really interesting. In China, <coughs> um, this is a very it had a lot of a cases. Lot of cases. It's, it's still a rare all case. Oriental people. <laughs> yes. Do you know why? And the difficult type for different, uh, maybe different posture. Well, yeah. Them. Let me tell you a story. I took care of a Chinese woman who was married to an Israeli, and they were living in Salt Lake. Just one. Just one. No, no, no. <laughs> you're, so like, she, you're like Oriental ladies. So she. <laughs> so my sister-in-law is Chinese. Oh, so. Uh, so I, I did her, this is really important, because I, I did her and the lateral spread did not go away. And um, she had a very large vessel and I was convinced I treated it because I moved the vessel and we, it was still there. And I just finished the operation because I didn't see any, you mentioned you can't see. And um, it didn't cure her. And so I offered to re-explore her and I found a, a large loop down underneath that I had missed and her lateral spread went away. Yeah. And what she told me after surgery was that um, once it went away and her mom came to visit, her mother felt very guilty. She felt like she had caused this condition. And I said, why would your mom feel like she caused this? And she said, well, in northern China, um, as a baby, uh, the, it's very appealing and acceptable to have a flat head. Flat, flat head and they put yes. all their babies on a hard surface when they're infants to flat to their head. And I thought, I wonder if that's why we see so much spasm in Chinese patients. It's an interesting because it's a cultural idea. thing. She said it's really common there to try to mold the skull when they're infants, just because that's considered an attractive feature. So I never noticed. I had her turn sideways. I pushed her hair, and yeah. her her back of her head was just flat. Yeah. And she had no room in her posterior pasta. Yeah. So I just thought it was interesting. It is. And I think so that's my theory. Of yeah. Chinese. But it's unfortunately it's Korean people mm -hmm. that had. Let me have my theory. Let me have my theory. <laughs> but it's, you're right. You're right. That's. Yeah. And it's, it's the shape. It's the shape of their head. Absolutely. I think so. 
That is, what, what my idea, sometimes uh, abnormal muscle response or lateral spread completely eliminated just to open posterior fossa. Yes. You don't move nothing. nothing. Just open posterior fossa, lateral spread is yeah. eliminated. It's just that and it's you, your concept, conception, straight. It's flat, flat. head. Just you open posterior fossa sometimes. Well, I think what happens is... 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 Well, I think